All right. Wow. That's loud. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Peter White Public Library. My name's Marty Ackett, and I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for the library. And um, I, I'm, always, I'm always really, it's a pleasure to have Michael here and doing his presentations. Um, I just want to make you aware of a few things that are, are coming up here um, for the rest of March. Um, we have two, basically two programs that are coming up. One is on Friday. We have our blockbusting matinee movie. Um, and that is going to be Everything Everywhere All at Once. And that starts at 12 p.m. here in the community room. Um, and then next week, Tuesday, March 28th at 7 p.m., we have Blues Day Tuesday, and that's going to be the Flat Broke Blues Band who are going to be performing here. Um, lots of great things coming up in um, April. I'll just give you some highlights. Um, we have the Great Lakes Poetry Festival, which happens at the end of the month, and the highlight of the Great Lakes Poetry Festival is going to be a reading by the 2022 Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry, um, Diane Seuss. And we also have a reading by the newly um, appointed UP Poet Laureate, Beverly Mathern, as well. Um, we have lots of films that are happening. Um, they, all of this is on the uh, handouts back there for April and March, if you need that, okay? Um, but you can also go to the Peter White Public Library page and look at the events page, which is pwpl.info. Um, I do have to thank uh, one group here that helps us with our live streaming, and that is the Friends of Peter White Public Library who provide all of this live streaming equipment. So if you are watching this now with us on li live or if you're watching it after the fact on our YouTube page, um, you have to thank um, the Friends of Peter White Public Library for, for providing the funds for that. So I'm just going to tell you a few things about Michael before we have him come up here and um, start his presentation. Michael was a um, trooper and detective sergeant with the Michigan State Police for 26 years. He's a certified search and rescue tech one and a crew leader um, by the National Association for Search and Rescue. Um, he founded the Michigan Backcountry Search and Rescue's Long Range Special Operations Group. And what that group does is it investigates long-term missing person cases and cold case homicides in the bush between the Upper Great Lakes and the Arctic Ocean in Ontario, Canada. Um, he has written a book called Missing Person Sourcebook, Strategies and Tactics for Finding Your Missing and Murdered Loved One from the World's Top Experts. Um, and he's been a wilderness guide for over 40 years. I could keep on going on and on about things that Michael has done, but I think he prefers that I just say, welcome Michael Niger to Peter White Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, for inviting me, and thanks to Peter White Library for hosting this. I... Uh, this is one of my favorite subjects, and uh, I'm a student of uh, tracking. My partner here, Todd Threat, is on uh, Marquette County Search and Rescue, as a lot of you know, and he's also a, a member of uh, Michigan Backcountry Search and Rescue, and we also um, we also um, guide trips together. And we did quite a bit of work on this. How many people here from Marquette County Search and Rescue? All right, so if there's any mistakes in this, it's his fault, because he just reviewed it, and he, we, we corrected about a dozen things, and then he said, it's, it's perfect. So I'm just joking, but I, I do appreciate his help, and he's brought some uh, equipment tonight to, um, to talk about. And um, So anyway, um, as far as man tracking, tracks are, as we can see up here, are the most common clue a person will leave behind in the bush, one every 30 inches or so, uh, depending on your your stride or your step. Um, and that photo right there is uh, of a case uh, that Todd and I are working on uh, up along the Arctic Ocean. We're looking for a, a Cree trapper. It's been missing. He's been missing for now. It's going to be uh, 20 years. We've found a lot of a lot of his stuff up there. We might be getting close to finding him, but it's a difficult area to work. So first thing we're going to talk about is man tracking equipment. And for you folks in search and rescue, this is, uh, you're going to know a lot of this already. You may know it all. Maybe you could be up here teaching it. I don't know. Some of you have probably taken man tracking classes, have you, in the past? or No? Okay. But uh, basically, a uh, pencil, you know, for note-taking, a waterproof pen. Of course, if it's raining, uh, waterproof paper is, is good, as you well know. Uh, Sharpie is good because we're on the next page. We're um, 
talking about, um, you know, writing on uh, flagging tape and what, whatnot. Uh, a tracking card, if you have one, I'm in the process of making one that I'll be putting online for free that anyone wants to use it. And uh, there's also, um, we'll talk about it, but there's other tracking cards available. A digital camera nowadays, our cell phones are better than most digital cameras, so a lot of us just use a cell phone. This uh, picture here is John Hurth. Uh, he's a uh, he's a retired uh, Airborne Ranger. Uh, he's one of our mentors for our team. He's written combat tra the tr combat tracking guide, and he also runs the uh, combat tracking school as well as a, a number of other um, um, schools. Uh, as far as more equipment, the tracking stick, we're going to talk about that a little later, and Todd has brought one to show us um, what it's all about, and uh, a, um, a short ruler, a CSI ruler, in other words, a crime scene investigation ruler. You want a really accurate ruler, a good quality one that works good in photographs. A small tape measure, a flashlight, uh, possibly with various lenses, we're going to talk about that. Uh, some toilet tissue paper and flagging tape, uh, orange, orange um, chalk line uh, powder, uh, wide-brimmed hat, a compass, a mirror. Perhaps you use the mirror if you've got uh, sighting compasses. You might use the mirror in your sighting compasses. Uh, a magnifying lens. Uh, most A lot of compasses have a little magnifier in it, which might uh, suffice. And then also, obviously a rucksack with your personal gear, water, food, fall weather stuff, whatever you need to uh, use while you're tracking. And as far as uh, types of man tracking teams, there's basically three different types. Uh, there's search and rescue tracking teams, uh, which um, is our main focus right here. Then you also have uh, military uh, combat tracking teams and police uh, tactical tracking teams. The main focus of this presentation is on um, uh, search and rescue tracking, but there's a um, huge overlap, obviously. This fellow here is uh, David Scott Donnellan. Uh, he's uh, one of the original um, famed Sela scouts, and uh, he's one of our um, our mentors for our team. He's written tactical tracking operations, and he also teaches, uh, runs the Scott Donnellan Tracking School. He's been uh, training tactical trackers for 45 years. Just a, a wonderful guy and a tremendous resource. Uh, as far as uh, team-wise, for a SAR tracking team, it's, it's, they're often... Uh, work uh, as, as have three members and they work in an in, inverted uh, V formation. Is that, uh, how do you folks do it at Marquette County or is it depend on the situation and how many people you got on going out? Yeah. But this is, this is common here and what you have is that the two flankers are about 10 foot back and they're stepped off about five feet and obviously this varies. Uh, the more books you read, the more people you talk to, the more teams you, you talk to and the, the situation in the woods you're in uh, is going to vary. But this is an approximation here and you, obviously your tracker works the track line looking for tracks on the ground the two flankers uh, they protect the tracker uh, in as much as looking for hazards maybe snakes or whatever else and they also keep an eye out for um, tracks and spore and when i say spore i'm just saying sign it could be evidence it could be somebody's dropped handkerchief it could be a boot print uh, in, in the uh, in the dirt and they keep an eye out for that um, on both sides, and then they also um, are responsible for communication, uh, navigation, and uh, taking notes and whatnot. And then the tactical tracking teams, they're, they're often uh, five or more team members. They function often in a Y formation. Your tracker, uh, again, works the track line, but in this case, uh, you have the flankers up ahead to uh, protect the, the uh the, the trackers and the whole team from ambush or any other uh, problems. And they also, you know, are keeping an eye out for tracks and whatnot. And your team leader is right behind the tracker, and that's generally, uh, they're generally responsible for the comm and navigation and notes, unless they have, a lot of times, teams might have a, a radio operator. So that would, um, you know, be an additional person perhaps, and they would have other responsibilities. And also your your last person, your sweet person, is facing back as rear security so that they don't get ambushed from the back. And now we're going to talk about step-by-step -step man tracking. This is basically uh, what man tracking is all about. And it's also known as track-by-track um, uh, -track 
tracking and micro tracking. This fellow here, David Hull, is another one of our mentors. Uh, he's been very helpful. Uh, he's written uh, the man tracking and law enforcement book, and he also uh, runs a uh, way of uh, tracking school. So step-by-step -step tracking is basic. It's a very effective tracking method, and it's going from one track in the ground to the next. So it's very slow and tedious. If you can imagine, if someone's been missing and they've they've got they've walked for several hours, and you're going from one track to the next, uh, it may take you, depending on the medium you're in, it could take you a long time to get across this room to find every track. So, but that's that's the good way to do it. But it's um, it's often uh, to, you know to close that time distance gap. If the person is still walking and you're walking uh, at the same rate, you're never going to catch them. So a lot of times you have to switch to what's called leapfrogging and sign cutting. And I imagine with search and rescue, sometimes you put multiple teams out. So you have someone working a trail, other people cutting ahead or sign cutting to try and catch up. So uh, it all depends on the situation. And some rules for su successful man tracking uh, operations is always uh, double check where you're starting from to make sure you're on the right track so that if you're looking for a hunter, you're not um, following the track of someone who else was out there hunting rabbits or something, a different person. You want to make sure you're on the, on the right track, and sometimes, obviously, that's difficult. Uh, you want to mark your starting point, that track, very good, so it's visible, so no one can uh, rush, uh, wreck it. And you also want to write down your UTM or GPS coordinates for it so you have a good record. And you want to document that track before you move on with a photo, photo it, uh, measure it, and sketch it. And we're going to talk about a lot of this. Uh, you never want to really walk on the spore that you're tracking. Uh, you want to walk alongside it. And so that you don't destroy it, and because so, many times you you may lose it, and you have to backtrack and um, restart your um, your track from that point if you've lost it, and if you've destroyed it or put a lot of other tracks on it, it may be difficult to do. And you don't want to overshoot your last track. In other words, you don't want to. Well, there's the last one. You just don't want to charge ahead, hoping you're going to come to one by the. And I've done that. Check. You're going to come to another one in the future. You you. Uh, you don't want to do that without, you know, marking it and then having a plan. You just don't want to wander around. And you want to, we're going to talk about that more. You're going to want to use light properly. In other words, you never want to get between the sun and the track. And we're going to talk about that in terms of contrast and shadowing. Um, and you always want to, uh, if you have aerial spore, we'll talk about different kinds of spore, but you always want to confirm uh, aerial spore because it can be unreliable. I mean, uh, deer can break branches off and, and other things can break branches. And um, so we don't want to just assume that the broken branch is, um, is the person we're looking for and then just continue on. We want to try and confirm that uh, perhaps with some other sign around there. So we're not, uh, we don't leave the track line accidentally in difficult situations. And you generally, you want to, in addition to looking, looking where, you know, down at the track, you want to look to the left and the right um, just to make, to see what's going on to see if there's any other spore, anything's been dropped or discarded, or perhaps the person has spun around on his track and gone in a different direction. So you want to, you know, keep your situational awareness there. And another big important thing is the tracker sets the pace, not another team member, because it's uh, tracking is extremely difficult unless you know you're following somebody in snow or somebody in mud, and so um, it's really important to let the tracker set the pace and don't over basically overrun your eyes. And you want to really avoid forcing something you see to confirm to your um, expectations, and uh, that's that's hard to do. Uh, contrast is the big key to successful man tracking. Uh, contrast is all about light and shadow and angle. And Todd and I will be talking about this, especially at night when we're using a tracking stick. He has a tracking stick. He can mount a, a flashlight down low on it. He can also he can also mount a flashlight on his his leg below his knee. So you get so you got the light down low. So your the track, if there's any depth to it at all, is casting a shadow, and when and then you can see it. In like the middle of the day when the sun is coming right down, or if you were to take a flashlight at night and shine it straight down on a track, you may not really be able to see it very well because you have no contrast. So light is huge, and angle is huge. Like if you're having problems seeing tracks, you can get down at another angle, and that may change the view, and you may be able to see it with difficult, with difficult um, 
um, tracks and situations. The uh, best time the track, we've got it right on here, is early and late in the day when the sun is down low. Uh, middle of the day is very difficult because the sun is straight ahead and it's really casting uh, no shadows. Where you've got shadows here in the morning on this side, so where you would want to be is standing over here. The afternoon you've got shadows here, but in the middle of the day you don't. It's all about contrast. And here's a good example here. I, I mentioned you don't want to be, get between the track and the sun. If you're between the track and the sun, your eye is right here. And you're looking like this. And the, the, the shadow that the sun is creating, which is normally going to be helpful, is going to be maybe out of view or maybe a lot less visible than it would be if you're over here on this side. That way you can see the contrast here and you can see the track. Now, obviously, when you have a track this deep, you're going to see it. But this is just um, kind of for uh, to show you what's going on here on a real shallow track. It's much more difficult, but you still have the shadow. And that's like um, at night you can get down low with your flashlight. You can actually, if you were to shine your flashlight right on this floor here down really low, you'd start to see sand particles and dust. But if you were up higher, you wouldn't see those. So it's all about contrast. So a huge thing to do is is to avoid having the sun behind you because then not only are you maybe blocking the sun, but you just you're, you're going to miss the opportunity to get contrast. Here's a good example. Here it may not be real clear, and um, but this is a, a a good a good position right here. The sun is in your face, so we're standing right here. The sun is over here coming straight at us. So you can see the contrast right in here. But if, if, you, if you flip this around and, and the sun is behind you here, you notice that it kind of disappears. You can see something here, but it's not as good. So um, this is, it may be hard to see, but um, that's what's going on there. Another trick you can use during the day when the sun is up real high and you don't have any contrast, example right here where you have no contrast, is take your take your hat or have someone stand in the way of the sun and um, shade it and then use a mirror with the sun or just use a really uh, bright flashlight and then you can create shadows and you can get down low and you can you can see tracks better so that's uh, one way you can um, you know improve it during the middle of the day and another way is uh, this would be more at night, but we talked a little bit about this, but in terms of positioning of the light, if you put the flashlight, if your light source is right up top and you're standing looking down, you may not see the track well unless it's a very uh, well-defined track. You can have poor contrast, no shadows, whereas over here, like with the sun, you're going to um, you're going to see some, some good shadows. And Todd, Todd just pointed out something to me about having the uh, light on the tracking sticker on your knee. You're actually... <laughs> You're actually behind your, you're not in a good spot, the optimal spot for um, the person over here looking. So you almost need someone, a lighting person, to, to optimize it. Uh, we can do it when we get to the tracking stick. Oh, I guess we're almost there. So Todd's going to demonstrate, uh, he's got a really nice light. And it's this light right here, I believe, right, Todd? Yeah, so we talked about it, you know, um, having a headlamp is difficult for when you're searching because if you look at your partner, you blind them at night, right? So, and I did that in training with some first-line SAR team guys because I usually work alone, so I had no idea about that. I'd look at them, talk to them, maybe they were getting upset. And uh, so I'm not, uh, not trained to do that. But basically, uh, you want to get a handheld light is best for tracking because you can get it down a little lower and use it obliquely. And then also mounting it on the shin or the top of the boot or a walking stick. So um, go ahead, Todd. Is 
Does that come with some lenses? It's got, it's got all the, all the small Okay. Thanks. I've done that in the winter tracking in snow, and it really fires up uh, tracks in the snow. Whereas if you have just a headlamp or the lamp up high, it's you really got to work to see stuff depending on the type of track. So it worked really well for me. This is um, I'm not real familiar with um, lenses, but this is this comes from one of our mentors here, Robert Spiden. He's a a tracking instructor and an author, and um, he likes an amber um, lens because I guess white especially now with the LED, they're so bright they can almost affect your vision after a while if you use them very much. So he likes an amber. It reduces the intensity, but it still works good for most of the stuff he does. And um, like a lot of us know, red is good for preserving night vision and up. Um, and green is. It's it's good for up-close reading, but it's really not, it's not uh, bright enough. But I think that may, and Todd, you may know, that may depend on the light and how many lumens it is, right? So I should have said this at the beginning, take everything that is presented here with a grain of salt, because if you had uh, 10 people up here talking about tracking, you might have 10 different opinions and then a hell of a fight, right? So that's why we only come in one at a time. So, um, and, and I have not tried this, but um, Robert says that, um, and he obviously hasn't either, I don't know if he lives with there's snow or not, but he said... Um, while blue isn't very good for tracking, uh, it can be. It may be helpful in snow, so that that's kind of interesting. Do you have a blue on yours? Have you used it at all in the snow? Yeah. Anyway, you can experiment with um, with lenses and whatnot. And now we're going to talk about uh, documenting uh, tracks and gait. And um, you want to record your notes and measurements on a notepad. Probably a waterproof would be best so that if you've got a lot of work into it, a lot of good stuff, um, that, uh, you know, if it rains and snows and, and you guys work in any weather, so uh, that's a big challenge. Um, or a tracking card. Um, and there's lots of those on the Internet. We'll talk about them in a minute here. And they're in a lot of tracking books. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a lot of the authors have made their own, and you'll see some here. So this is a tracking card here from Arizona Search and Rescue Coordinators Association. Basically, what you want to do on the left is the form not filled out. When you get to the track, you want to draw as much as you can see. Uh, it's real important that you don't add stuff that you can't see. You only add what you know is f factually um, visible there. Uh, lugs and channels, grooves, worn areas, if you can see them, sometimes the substrate will cast a track really well and you'll be able to see cuts and small damaged areas. You want to mark those. Uh, brand marks and logos, basically anything you see. Sometimes there, there may be something lodged in the sole, like it could be a tack or a nail or a rock stuck between... Um, between a couple lugs, and obviously that could fall out, but it's worth noting because that really individualizes it, especially if you're on an area where there a lot of people are walking, and I suppose a lot of your cases in search and rescue you have, there were people like to hike and walk, so you have, well, that could be a real challenge. And we're going to talk about each of these individually here in terms of what you're recording in measurements and I'm going to have a, I'm going to make up a, a new tracking card that'll have all of this on it, uh, and it'll be um, 
Todd will know about it. He'll be looking at it and helping me with it, and it'll be online. You can print it out on 8.5 by 11, fold it in half. One half the page will be the left foot. The other half will be the right foot. It'll have all of this on here, and I'm going to skip reading through this because it's uh, it's going to be covered here shortly. But you can see on the on the Arizona Search and Rescue card they have uh, a lot of areas to write information down. And the other handy thing uh, is Todd and I, the form Todd and I are going to work on is going to have graph paper behind it, kind of like this. That way, if you folks are out talking on the uh, at different uh you're on different tracks or in different areas you can you can say okay it's going to be in one a there's maybe like a nail right here so you can you'll be able to describe where some feature is on the bottom of the sole uh somewhat accurately using the the a b c and the one two three four five six seven eight which is a really good idea and this is a tracking card here by uh, John Hurth. It's in his book, and so there, a lot of them are very similar. This one obviously is is filled in, uh, and it's it's uh, he's recording what he sees here. Now this is like we can all be expert trackers with a track like that in sand, right? And I would be the first one to be right there. Well, that's that's the card you carry. Okay, great. What size is it? About it's a few inches, like a three by five or. information you fill out on the back so it prints two two sheets per um, page and you print in front and the back and then you get two cards you could loot use it for left and right they're actually drawn with um, both lefts and you just uh, oh never mind sorry it, it, the, it's the other ones on the back and then there's more um, information to gather on the back great he's improved them and here's another this is a really good um, card here and it's um, by um, Boris Voss and he's a former Royal Nether Netherlands Marine he's uh, he's an instructor uh, in sniper school jungle warfare and combat tracking and now he runs uh, what they call what he calls the lead ranger school in Kenya but he has a really nice form and uh, he actually um, because the heel of the foot is usually the first thing that hits the ground and has a lot of pressure on it He's found that there's a lot of a lot of detail there, depending on the what what what's uh, casting the footprint. So he actually has a, a section down at the bottom in large just for drawing the heel, because there's sometimes a lot of detail there that's harder to show up above on the uh, the full size one. Absolutely, yeah. So it would be uh, indivi it would individualize the footwear depending on the surface you're on, how much detail you can get. And one of the things you want to do before going very far with a track, especially your main one, your best one, is to photograph it. That way you're not accidentally touching it and, and messing it up. So photograph it. And it's really important, especially if some of your cases at search and rescue, if you're working on criminal cases, or they might come down to be criminal in the future, that you know you, you do stuff as good as you can from an evidentiary standpoint. And, and one of the key things with uh, photographing tracks so that um, they, uh, they can do footwear comparison at the crime lab and whatnot is to uh, make sure you photograph it on the same plane. In other words, if the track if the track is right here on this surface you're going to want your camera on the same plane level with it basically so you're not going to you're not going to want it at an angle okay i mean you can take some it's good to take photos at an angle but the ones for comparison you're going to want it you're going to want it on the same plane so it'll be level and you also want it directly over it you want to look where the camera is and put it directly over it in other words you don't want to be off to the side a little bit and that'll give you a you know a, a true picture, and then of course you're going to want to have a ruler in it there. And I think Todd, do you have your CSI ruler? Yeah, it's just a little crime scene grade uh, forensic crime lab grade uh, ruler. You can write on it and erase it, and it has uh, 
inches and uh, meters on it. This is a little fancier one here. We don't usually carry those in the woods, but um, that's um, what we're talking about. And then as far as lighting, uh, again, you're not going to want, you're going to have to see what looks best, but generally you're not going to want to use the flash that's on the uh, camera. You could try that, but it's just probably going to wash it right out and take out all your contrast. So you're going to want to have someone um, manipulate the light, um, you, um, either using probably side lighting, oblique lighting, you're going to want to move the light. Because when I worked in a crime lab, we always had detachable flash units. We'd have the camera and the flash, and we could put the flash off to the side, mount it wherever we want, use a couple, couple of them to get contrast. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so again, um, side lighting. You can see the, uh, the nice... The contrast right in here correct it looks like the light is over to the side see how the heel is kind of a little bit washed out although it's flatter but when you get further away you got good contrast here so you basically got to move your light around to where um, you can see the most contrast and then once you've photographed it uh, there's many ways of doing this it depends on how you're trained and what your protocol is but uh, usually I think in NASA are trains this way I believe that's how they trained me the National Association of Search and Rescue they require this is their protocol whoops this is let's see here I gotta back up okay this is their protocol so when you have a partial footprint let's just say you could just see the heel you just put a line right behind it like this and then you put a tick mark right here another line right here to show whether that it's right or left and you just continue on and mark them like that uh, you could also um, mark your tracks in terms of if you want to look back on them you uh, sometimes people mark them with talcum powder or foot powder or a little white powder or orange contrasting powder they just shake on it or they just take little scraps of toilet paper and and lay by them and then you can look back and you can see the track line and you can kind of see which way it's probably going so it all depends um, what you're doing and how much time you've got and how difficult your situation is And if you have a complete track, um, you want to circle it and then mark it left or right. And that's that's uh, when you get a complete track like that. Uh, when you have partial tracks, you can keep adding to like the, this tracking card that Todd had. You would, when you see a different part of the track, uh, the tread, you can add that to it and keep building on it. And then now with technology, you can um, not only can you communicate with your radio, but you could you could send a picture. <laughs> around to people real quickly and easily if you have that capability and I would imagine um, you probably have to do that with um, you probably have to have communication with the, with uh, cell phone correct Todd there's really no way of sending images without even with your uh, radio communication now right you probably can't send okay and th this uh, we're going to go into a section now on measurements that go on the tracking card and um, so you want to get the heel length and the sole length, as it's shown on here. And you want to do that for both the left and right sole. Uh, general, obviously, a lot of times, you know, these measurements are going to be the same no matter what. But you just don't know, depending on how a shoe has been worn or damaged or um, whatever. So if, if you have the opportunity, plus, even if they're the same, you can, once you measure something a few times, you can get an accurate measurement. You can average them because this is a perfect print here, but in sand and other kinds of um, substrate, it's going to be difficult to get a precise measure. But if you have like four or five measures, then you're going to be feel relatively confident in what you're looking for and what the approximate measurement is. So you want the width of the heel, width of the sole. And then we get into the stride length. And I will say, um, I've got about every book there is. Todd has most of the books on, on man tracking. There's a lot of different terminology that people use. One book, an author is using stride means one thing. Another person, uh, stride means a different thing. And there's steps and straddle and all this. So this is uh, what I've gone with here. So don't get too hung up on the... Um, on the terminology because it's it's going to vary depending on who you're talking to but you want to get the stride length on both sides now obviously if it's a very difficult case and you have a half a track here and then you don't have anything more till you get up here you're not going to be able to um, get some of these measurements but when you do have the opportunity when you come up to a good track trap like some mud and you have several tracks then you can establish a track line down the center and you can start to get some of these other measurements and and then just record them on your track card 
Uh, sometimes a shortening stride may indicate the person's about to, you know, they're anticipating a turn. So if you know the stride, now this, Todd and I were talking about this, this may be a little bit generous here, a 60 inch stride. And, um, um, it, you know, I'm tall, so if I'm really walking, I'm up in there, but it's probably going to be uh, less than that, depending. And just like here, um, a 30-inch stride. That If I'm really stepping out, I probably have around a 30-inch stride, but some people may have like 24, so you got to take this with a grain of salt. So here you want to have the you know the right step and the left step length. If you once you get enough tracks, you can you can determine this. And this this is something that um, is not essential, but if you have good tracks, uh, you can you can get the outer step width and the inner step width. And this this isn't essential either, but you can get a feel for it um, in terms of uh, if you want to get really technical in it. This line here, you can take your compass and you can you can figure out what the offset is and record that. Or uh, a lot of times, you could go with a non a non degree scheme here of a positive, neutral, or negative in terms of how the foot, whether it toes in or out. So you can kind of record the the amount of information that's right for what you're doing. And here's the tracking stick which uh, Todd has here for us and. Um, I'll uh, let him talk about that a little bit, but basically, uh, in a nutshell, you can just use a couple rubber bands, and he can um, talk to you about it right here. Jack, could you give him the mic, please? Sure. Can you hold it for me? Sure. Can everyone kind of see this okay? Um, on the stick, I've got these rubber bands. Um, these are actually from a farm supply. I think they're castration rings. So they, they slide pretty tight on here. And just like it shows in the in the picture on the, the diagram there, you slide them up to where, to represent different measurements of the, the, the track. So not only is it gonna be the step length or the stride length, depending on what you're doing, but usually, like you said, it's gonna be the, the step length because you're, you're looking for the next track in the series. So you're going right, left, right, left. Um, so you'd set this up so back here somewhere uh, where you're holding on to this is going to be the back of the heel of the track, the known track, and then you're going to be sweeping the tip to where the next track should be just ahead of your your stick. And then at the same time, at the same time from from that heel mark, the next band is then the track length, so that would be the toe. Then I would have say heel width, and then I would have toe width right there. So that, that would be the main, the four main measurements, your overall length right there, the, the tracking stick would be the step, then the, the one track uh, length, heel width, toe width. If you had, say, a irregularity where, where the left or the right is completely different than the other, you could use an additional band to do another width or another length or whatever you need to there. But generally all you need is those four measurements. Does that make sense? And then this this right up here, this graphic here, this is how Todd's using it. He has this, the back rubber band is the heel, and he's just sweeping it. He's just sweeping it. Just keep it off off the ground so you're not damaging the track. So this is right down, right down on the track, and then that's where you need to look for the Does that make sense? If you have really faint tracks, or you can't see them, or you got to get down, that's that's how we. Um, can find tracks, but obviously it uh, can be a slow process, but sometimes there, you, you don't have any other choice. And as Todd mentioned, when you're down there, you don't want it on, on the ground, you don't want it on the track, because you're going to damage it, the track, and you're also going to add additional marks in there. If you don't realize, it's going to be confusing, and uh, you may make you know errors in judgment. Another reason to have photographed the track beforehand and to mark it clearly. And usually there's going to be other people out there with you, depending on what you're doing. So you want the track mark so that no one else uh, steps in it. Um, I've done this uh, with, I've just, on times when I've needed a, um, a tracking stick and I didn't have a walking stick, I've just grabbed a stick out of the woods, 40 inches long, and I just marked it with my knife, you know, where I needed it to, uh, I was tracking um, 
a lot of times cases, most of the cases that Todd and I work on together, unlike first line SAR teams, they're months or years old. And uh, so we work animals. We track wolves a lot and cougars and uh, bear and stuff because, you know, they're predators and uh, they like to move bones around and stuff. So we, we'll track them. So sometimes we just, if we don't have our tracking stick with us, we can, we will just make a um, stick like this. And, and I've used it tracking coyotes and wolves before to uh, the same way you would with uh, human tracks. And then obviously for the tactical trackers, they're going to probably use their weapon and uh, they could mark that a number of ways, but they could just do it simply with some kind of tape. And now we're going to talk about types of spore sign. In other words, when someone walks through the woods, what do they leave behind in addition to and including uh, tracks? And as I mentioned before, uh, you never want to step on sign because you may need to come back to it. So you're usually, instead of walking right down the track line, if the person is like walking on the trail, we're probably going to be walking along the edge of the trail so we can look at it and not walk over it. Better not trip here. Oh, this is this is old Freddie Osana. He was in the UP. He was training um, some um, search and rescue people up in uh, Keweenaw not too long ago, and they may have him back. He's a really a really cool guy. I'm a Marine Scout sniper, uh, and he has written this book here, Index Tracker. He's been very helpful to me. And uh, he's also the founder of Greenside Training. So he does a lot of different types of training for both the military. Uh, he was actually the lead instructor for the U.S. Army Combat Tracker course. So um, a lot of these guys do a lot, of, have a lot of contracts um, with the military. And he, he write, I think it was in his book he was writing about when he was over overseas. I don't know if he was in Iraq where he was, but um, they were going through this... Um, area were a graveyard and there were, um, I'm not sure what you call them, um, um, little buildings that they put bodies in or whatever. And um, you could walk into, I don't know, a mausoleum or tombs, whatever. Yeah, they were, it was very common to have little individualized ones and they were going through there and, and they were getting ambushed. You know, when you'd walk past one, you could get shot from the behind. So he was, he was uh, how they would tell if anyone was in there. And we'll talk about it a little later is the cobwebs on there. If there were, if there were cobwebs, they were all set. If they weren't, someone had just gone in there was going to ambush him. So um, very uh, interesting um, technique using the you know the spore that they had available and this um most of you folks that are in search and rescue have probably heard of the searcher's cube in terms of you know on the ground uh, to the side and then aerially then looking all the way around well it's also the same with the the man tracker's cube in terms of looking for spore and um spore can be obviously on the ground we're used to that people drop stuff and there's tracks there's also side or middle spore or depending on what you want to call it, could be broken brush. It could be a handkerchief you had in your pocket that was pulled out and is hanging on a, the edge of a tree. Um, and then you have aerial spore stuff that's up higher you know, above you. And some of our cases that Todd and I have are survivalists who've cached stuff out in the woods in remote areas and actually spend months out there. And so they've stored up a lot of stuff. And sometimes with food, that's what they do is they hang it up in buckets high in a tree. So when we're tracking, we have a case we're looking for a guy. We still are looking for him. Um, we're looking for that kind of stuff, you know, cached up high. He would either bury his food in pickle buckets underground or he would hang them from trees. So um, uh, depending on, and, and you folks are looking for hunters and you have hunting stands now are real popular and tree stands. So um, it's, um, you kind of have to look all the way around you. And it's, uh, it's, um, I've, I was trained when I was trained by, um, for search and rescue by NASAR, they had a statistic. They told us if you look back regularly, you're going to find 5% more evidence because it's like, if I'm, if I'm walking here past this pillar and I look at it now, but I don't look at the back side of it, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss some evidence. So it's, it's good to look behind you and around. You can, you can stuff, especially with man tracking. It's all about contrast. So you may look at it, something right here, and you can't see it like it's right in front of Todd. But if I go over here, I've changed the contrast. So um, it's really important to, um, to look around. So 
this is some of the spore you can see here. You got pine needles. We've all seen this when we walked. You walk in pine needles or leaves, how they'll push ahead. And so that's called one of the names for its nesting. So that's, there's really no track in the ground here per se, but you can see the outline of the, the footprint here. Now, a lot of these photos aren't real high quality. I'm going to replace them. These came from Interpol. And um, they're just not, they're just, uh, because of the medium I got them in, in this PDF document, they're not uh, real high quality. So I apologize for that, but they still um, tell the story. And here's a place where you're going uphill or downhill, whatever it is, the boot is actually sliding in the dirt. So that's um, something to look for. That's, that's considered spore, like all of this stuff is. Uh, we also have here where um, we have moss. Moss is very fragile. You'll see on the left here, it's, on the rock, uh, it's it's slid Todd and I have, We have lots of moss in the UP. Todd and I have worked cases up by the in the Arctic watershed, Arctic Ocean watershed, uh, and we almost cracked our skulls open. There's like moss, sphagnum moss. It's um, or lichen that's like four or five inches thick on rock. There's no roots, and it's wet under there even when it's dry on top. Oh, yeah, really dangerous. So, but that leaves, uh, that's good spore when someone passes by. And, and if, if it's not disrupted, there's a good chance no one walked through there. So that's still probative. And then over here, you'll on branches, you can see this is either a boot print on here or someone grabbed it with their hand. So um, that's basically uh, what they call disturbance. And that's um, you'll see that quite frequently. And then flattening. And as you can see on the left here, you know, normally you got all these rocks around. Here they're all pushed right down in the dirt. So this is flattening. So that's that would be, um, so, uh, you know, a, a good clue right there that if you're tracking someone in, in the track line, you see that you're still on it. There's a good chance it's flattened. And you can see over here, uh, the moss is packed down. And um, so um, that's uh, called flattening. Risers, you can see, it's hard to see here, but I think this grass is up high and then there's maybe a leaf up here that's lifted up. So um, that's uh, what I think is going on there. Flagging and pointers, we've all seen this in tall grass, or when a vehicle drives in tall grass, how it, it, it packs, the, pushes the grass down in the direction it's going. That's what you've got right here. It's pushed down, and same thing here. So this is uh, called flagging. Some people call it pointers, but the vegetation will kind of not only show you a track, but it'll give you a direction. Shine. Um, I've got a better example of it coming up, but this is in a micro sense here where you have just one leaf. Something's disrupted that and flipped it over. This is the bottom side. Normally, it's the dull side is up, but something's disrupted it there, and same thing here. Um, so th this is aerial spore that you have to, you're going to want to confirm this with something else because obviously a deer could do this uh, as in, a, in addition to um, maybe the person you're looking for. And here's a little better example of shine right here. You can see it. It's it's not uprooted, but it's it's disturbed the vegetation. So you can see it there, the shine right here, the dull. And then you can also see the shine here in the field from um, probably several people walk through there, but you can kind of see the difference in how it looks in the big picture versus over here. So that's, that's shine. Um, um, Spore that's crushed, so I'm um, just animal scat droppings. If if it's stepped on, it's going to flatten, like on the left here. So that's that's a good clue in combination with other things. Here, you have some insects or whatever. It could be anything that's crushed on top of this rock. So that's uh, you know some good a good spore there. And here we have, you can see some abrasion here. And we're probably, anyone that goes in the woods probably have seen where ATVs and stuff go over uh, logs and stuff where they'll knock the bark off. And that's very evident. Here, uh, this, you know, by just stepping on it with a vibram sole or whatever, you could mark it. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. So this is, this would be indicative of something uh, crossing this. Now, it also could be hooves of animals and stuff on there, but in combination with your other, uh, maybe you'll see some crushed vegetation up here or, or whatnot. So the wear and tear, a lighter color. Uh, over time, this would be dark again. It would age. So 
um, dis dislodged um, spore. So obviously here you have a log that's for some reason knocked out of where it was. And a bear do that a lot, animals looking for ants and stuff. But in combination with other spore, here's a rock that's twisted out. So that's dislodged stuff. So that's um, that can be real helpful. And this is particularly interesting. You see a lot of this. It's called socketing. And I, I don't have a real good example here of, like, here's a rock here, and you don't see any little, the sand is packed right up around it here, which is kind of how it normally would be. Um, but once it's kicked or moved, you can see it's, like, jiggled, and it's created extra room. So that's what they call socketing. And you can see the little socketing right here, and perhaps a little socketing here, and then socketing right here. But if you were to see those when they're undisturbed, the soil from the rain and the wind and stuff would be packed all the way around. So that's a real good uh, indicator there that um, something's been through there. Uh, transfer, obviously. Um, mud and soil so we've all seen transfer when we come into our house and we track mud in so that's transfer so you're looking for transfer uh, uh, in this case uh, there's some trans there's some mud here on this log right here and then there's stuff has been transferred onto uh, this leaf but you could see transfer on all kinds of different surfaces color change you can see a little disruption right here a little darkness right there so that would be helpful if you were working a track line and you had to choose where to go. You would want to check that out. Same thing over here. You can see some color change there. And we already mentioned this a little bit, water and mud transfer. Now, obviously, if it's water, it's not going to last long. But um, if you're you know, tracking someone recently, uh, it's, it, it may work. It depends on the temperature, but also they're probably going to be... Um, tracking some sand and mud on there which would be harder to see but you're going to get right down there and check it out splash this goes without saying this is along a road here and i don't know i i the first time i saw that really demonstrably was driving on the scene stretch and the deer will come out of one of those ditches they'll be swimming you know the ditch on one side they run across the road and here's this water trail going right across now obviously that's not going to last long but i've always remembered that uh broken branch here as we mentioned that's aerial spore so you're going to want to confirm it so uh who knows what broke that off um could have been the wind could have been a deer animal or it could have been you know someone passing through so um but that's good sport to, to combine with everything else you've got a bent leaf Definitely, uh, especially uh, on the ground, you'll step on them. I don't have an example of that, but actually in the right scenario or a pine needle or other vegetation, you'll step on it and you'll have actually two cracks in it. It'll take the impression of the sole. It'll break it on both sides depending on what it's supported by. Uh, bruising or mashing like this. Uh, the cobwebs, we already talked about that, uh, depending on, you know, when you're out there and what the scenario is uh, in the timeline, those can be those can be helpful. Human waste uh, that goes without saying. Sometimes uh, a lot of people, you know, some people carry toilet paper may have it available, and you'll see that in the picture. But also, um, uh, people use toilet paper or leaves or uh, moss, whatever, or actually snowballs in the winter, depending. So that's that can be something that uh, you don't want to overlook. Blood drops, that's pretty obvious. Litter, you know, cigarettes are common. Uh, any kind of, any kind of um, human um, litter, you want to take a look at it and see how it factors into your, your situation. And smells and odors, uh, we know how far we can smell um, cigarette smoke away. We're, we're driving in our car, and we can kind of smell it when we go through an intersection or someone nearby. So uh, smoke is, is real powerful. Campfire smoke, and we we probably, you know, that carries a long, long ways depending on, on the volume of it. Cooking odors and other stuff. So these are some other... Um, depending on the situation other things you want to monitor and same thing with noise uh which would be real fortunate to have the easiest example is if you start to hear a faint whistle that's maybe the guy person you're looking for um so that kind of goes without saying and also depending you know if you're in a in a tactical tracking situation uh silence sudden silence uh can can alert you that you're you're near something or something's going on and we've probably all heard that so sign cutting this is uh, 
a really fun part of man tracking. And it basically, it's the process of searching for spore or sign, searching for tracks, so you can start tracking someone. So um, maybe when, if you're in search and rescue, you have this person's car in a parking lot or something. So you're going to start looking around that vehicle and see if you can pick up the person's track or some kind of spore to get a direction of travel, to narrow things down. So here's some tips on sign cutting. You want to you look behind you, and we mentioned that already, as, as much as you can, just because of better contrast, and you may actually um, find stuff that you, you didn't see um, when you walked past it. You want to go slowly, and you want to examine like a three-stride area. And, um, and you, again, uh, you don't want to be rushed. You know, your eyes are going to set the pace, not your feet. So you, this is all about what you're going to see there. And another nice thing to do, a tip in terms of what you should, when you're in, when you're looking at the ground, like it'd be nice to know what you could expect to see on there and what you couldn't expect to see. Obviously, if you're in, if you're in a muddy area, you're going to expect to see a muddy print. But if in other areas, it may be hard to tell, to know what you're really going to be able to see and not see. So it's what's called index or reference, referencing. So do you just, in an area where there is no track, where you're sure you're not going to contaminate, just walk there and then come back and take a look at it and see what you can see. And that'll give you an idea what you can expect to see. And if, if it's basically you can't see anything at your skill level, uh, then you may want to um, use some other methodology to, to find the track. You may not want to spend too much time there. You may want to cut around or go to another area uh, to speed things up. So once you've got your initial clue, whether it be a car or a gear, one way of handling it is, is, is what's called the expanding circle sign cutting. And, um, you know, from the known clue, you just go around in a circle and see if you can pick up pick up a track or something. If you don't find anything the first time around, you go a second time. And then all of a sudden you may find something here. Then you've got the approximate track line. Now, obviously, if it's all mud or if it's snow, you're probably going to pick it up right away. But when it's difficult, you can go around. I don't really care for circling too much because it's hard for me to navigate in a circle and look at the ground. I don't know about what you folks, I prefer to box. And obviously, I prefer to have Todd there doing the navigation or something. Or I would do the navigation and he'd do the looking. That's the beauty of having some help. But circling, you know, if you're in a field, you could put a, you could put a marker out there where that your spore is, and you could walk around. But if, if you can't see it, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to, to do a good circle. So, um, but this, this kind of work here is really handy, you know, in a parking lot or somewhere that's heavily contaminated. Maybe you folks get the call, you come out there, and there's already been the family's been out there, and the police have been out there and walking around, so you really can't hope to find anything right maybe around the car. You may have to get out of ways. So this is what will allow you to do that. Here's the exact same thing here that I prefer um, would be boxing because I can use uh, do some navigation. As long as I've got, you know, you're gonna. it would be good to have someone doing the navigation so the person the tracker can just focus on the ground. And you just keep doing uh, larger and larger squares until you find something. It might be a track, might be a broken branch, might be some crushed vegetation. And then you can start to um, clover leaf around that and see uh, what you find. Uh, feature sign cutting, another way of doing this, uh, if you don't have, um, if you're not sure but you want to check this area, you just walk along this walk along this this feature in this case it's a railroad grade and just look for tracks along along the railroad grade and see if you pick up a track going into the woods or coming out or walking along it then you can you decide if that's relevant to your case maybe you'll find a piece of gear that the person dropped and then that will that will be your no, new starting point and then you're going to try and find out which way they were going from that maybe they walked along the railroad grade and it went back in here to their deer blind to hunt so um, this is feature sign cutting, just walking along a, a linear feature. And then there's perimeter sign cutting, where you would look at your map and you would say, okay, we got a two track up here, a foot trail right here, the railroad grade here, and we got the river. So uh, if, 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 if you were thinking they may be in here, then you could just handrail along all those features, which are all good um, track traps, which we're going to talk about, and see if you have anybody coming in and out of there. And if you don't, you can... Um, well, another thing you can do with this, uh, these are kind of overlapping here. If, if you could just do a zigzag sign cutting through here looking for sign to see if you see anything using these natural boundaries here and then using your compass or GPS. 
the other thing you can do if you've done the perimeter search and, and you don't find any tracks coming in and out that you can work, but you still think they're in there, you can just collapse your box and do a box in here and see if you can catch them going in and out and smaller and smaller. What works really good for that is, uh, do you guys use, folks use the UTM system or the, uh, or using Latlon mainly? Yeah, if you use the UTM system, which we use, Todd and I use all the time, you can, you can uh, it's basically like graph paper laid right down uh, on, the, on the earth, and it's real easy to work with your GPS and work lanes in here. But um, anyway, this, uh, this is uh, a grid search. We're all familiar with that. It's pretty tedious and slow and not a good way to look for lost people because if they're not in that grid, uh, they're going to probably die two miles away. And so, um, but this is a good, a good way to, you could first go north to south in here. Didn't find them, you could go east to west. And if you folks in search and rescue use probability detection probably. You're familiar with that somewhat in terms of what's the probability of finding something in certain terrain. And you, whether if you're looking for a shoe, you could, you could set it down in the train you're actually looking and then back off to where how far away you can see that shoe and then you walk all the way around and you can average it and you can say okay and so when you get to a point where you can't see it then you really don't want to have your if you're searching a line search you don't want to have your people any farther away than that or you may miss it so um that's a whole science in it in and of itself and then you could also this is an interesting technique here if you've got like a a, um, a wide dirt road or like a power line, you could have a flanker go down each side of the power line here looking for tracks and whatnot, and then you could have the other person um, zigzagging along like this, and it gives you the opportunity to see um, tracks from a couple different perspectives in terms of uh, lighting. It also works well on uh, trails when you have changed lighting conditions. And then I got to get moving along here. This is um, a leapfrog, leap, uh, leapfrog sign cut, and we talked about going from track to track. It's pretty darn slow. So if you have a flanker or a second person, they can jump ahead like this and do a big arc like this and see if they pick up the trail. And in this case here, the person finds a track here. So this person here jumps up and comes out and does this, and they happen to find a track here. And so that moves you ahead to close that time and gap distance because tracking is can be really, really slow. And uh, if your person is moving, they could be moving miles. And uh, it may take forever to get catch up to them unless they stop. Track traps. These are really important, or pretty much most of us are probably familiar with these, especially in search and rescue. There's certain areas that really lend themselves to um, tracks. And obviously mud holes, mud, you know, things like that cast really nice. So um, in dirt fields, um, this is Border Patrol country here. It's, it's a lot easier than tracking uh, in areas that we have up here where it's just tons of vegetation and there's, there's three or four inches of leaves and other debris on the ground, which makes it very difficult. Uh, muddy areas, we mentioned that already. Sandy areas uh, are, are great for uh, recording tracks. Uh, tree lines, uh, there's usually a change in vegetation on the ground there, and people tend to hand handrail along the edge of fields or the edge of tree lines, so that's another good track trap. Uh, landscape formations, you can see here there's a big depression right here, so you could walk around out here and sign cut to see if anyone came out of there or went down in there. Uh, steep slopes, they mark up real well. You can, you can see here there's a lot of marking on them, so steep slopes are good places to look for tracks. Obviously, we don't have a lot of dry riverbeds in, in uh, Michigan. They're usually wet, but uh, dry riverbeds are uh, a good place because they're easy to walk and they cast tracks pretty good. Uh, waterway crossings, we've all seen that when you come down, when a trail comes down to cross a creek or something. Uh, it's uh, a good place to look for tracks, and it may be damper, so it would cast better. Uh, stream bed, this is uh, 
depending on the current and what the bottom of the river is made of, many times you can see tracks if someone walked down a stream bed or crossed it. So it's it. And if you're if you're close to someone uh, following them, you're actually going to see uh, debris disturbance in the water a little bit. Lake shores and river banks, they go without saying. There's a uh, they're a good they're a good track trap because there's usually a transition where you don't have grass and you may have some mud or something, and, and you've got other things to you can see broadleaf plants. Um, if you have a lot of vegetation, the taller vegetation, if someone walks through that, they're really going to disrupt it, and you're going to see it, and you'll see some shine, like as example here that we saw before. Same thing with tall grass. It's uh, going to disrupt that. We've all been out and seen where like a deer walk through an area and you can kind of see it or where a bear went or some, something moved through there and really parted the grass. Fire breaks are uh, a great place because they're just like, they're two tracks, sandy. So it's, it's, they're good track traps, uh, dirt roads without saying. Um, ditches and road shoulders are real good too. Uh, sometimes there's some dampness there and, and, and sometimes there's no grass. So you have uh, a chance to to see some tracks and uh, road junctions and trail junctions uh, obviously go without saying that you know there's usually a lot of people are a lot of times using trails and whatnot as opposed to walking straight through the woods so um, junctions are worth taking a good look at uh, roadside debris even though it's a paved, maybe a paved road a lot of times there's a lot of dirt there and dust and debris and pine needles so those are in this case it actually you can see a track right there but uh, even if that track wasn't there you can see how the pine needles have been moved here so that would be uh, something worth spent taking a look at and comparing it with what else you've um, you've seen before that uh, obviously steep embankments you can see here the person's cutting in that goes without saying so it's steep embankments if there's an embankment around your area or going through it you're going to want to take a look at it because it's going to be an easy way to spot a track real fast funneling areas it just it could be a a, a a gorge or a valley where um, the deer go up the valley and all the people go up the valley so look for natural funnels and check those this is a little hard to see here but you've got rock on this side and a steep hill here and you can kind of see there's a uh heavily heavy use here over time so this would be an area to check for spore as opposed to just going over into the woods or on some steep slope this would be a good place to um, check and another funnel here is is between people aren't necessarily going to walk right in the water they're not necessarily going to walk in the snow they're going to handrail right along here so this is kind of a natural funnel right here to check at this time of the year and snow that goes without saying it's great for uh, casting tracks Utility right-of-ways and pipelines and power lines, a lot of times uh, it's easy to walk on those, and a lot of times there's a two-track on them, and uh, there's the kind of vegetation where you can see um, if someone moved through there. So those are those can be good track traps. Obviously, foot trails are um, a lot of times they have dirt or sand or mud on them, so that's a good place to see tracks, although you're going to see a lot of tracks because a lot of people use them. Uh, game trails. Uh, Todd and I work game trails all the time because it's generally the predators out there are moving things around and um, evidence of missing people and whatnot. So we spend a lot of time on game trails and have found a lot of really critical evidence on game trails that have been moved by wolves and coyotes and whatnot. In fact, Todd solved a case for us up by the Arctic Ocean. Um, we ran four expeditionary SAR operations up there. Uh, over two and a half years or something, and we were working game trails. Todd was on point, found the jaw belonging to the guy, been missing for two years, and then eventually we found the skull and a lot of other, uh, the remainder of the body. So uh, I'm really big on um, checking game trails once you get into a case a few days or a few weeks, and, and depending on what the situation is, because animals, um, I've found evidence uh, in scat. Human human hairs that have gone to the FBI. I've, all I've got in this one guy are two human hairs. That's all I've found so far, and that was you know in uh, in wolf scat. And uh, so game trails are, um, and they're they're and the reason they're up here is they're good track traps. Obviously, you, you see game trails, deer trails, you see hoof prints and stuff. So, and and if you were to walk through the woods, if you were you know lost, I, I would just soon walk down this as opposed to go through heavy brush or something. So, game trails are really powerful. Fences, people handrail along them, and when they have to climb them, sometimes they're gonna they're going to. Um, leave some marks on them and even when they're hand railing you could walk along 
uh, the uh, the fence and everyone's maybe you'll come to a muddy spot or something or where a game trail is and you might it'd be a good track trap so those are worth checking lost anybody needs to leave go right ahead we're kind of running we're we're 10 after 8 but this is, so feel free to just get up and walk out no big deal but um, so you found tracks and you're tracking the person all of a sudden you just lose their track for whatever reason that's what this section is all about here. And, and what we said before, you don't want to advance behind your last known track without a plan. You only step where you can ID your tracks. In other words, you don't want to just go for a little walk and then you can't find them and you come back. And then, you know, you've got your tracks and your partner's tracks are there. So it can be very confusing. So you don't want to add sign. And what, and when you lose a track, you want to back up and mark your last known track and flag it so everyone knows where it is because you may be coming back to that a couple times to, to restart, as you'll see here. So the first thing you want to do is uh, what Todd was showing us, how to use the tracking stick. Use your tracking stick and see if you can find any evidence. Can't find any uh, any with your tracking stick, then you like to do a two-meter. Now, this is all approximate here based on the situation and your training or what you've got time for. But um, the initial scan, you know, just stand there and look around 360 degrees in a two-meter circle and see what you can see. Maybe the subject, you know, made a sharp turn or backtracked. You know, if you can't see any spore when you're standing, get down on your hands and knees and look at things and move all the way around it. And then have your partner do the same thing, see if, if, if they can pick up something. If that doesn't work, then you can do an initial probe. That's about 10 meters in diameter. You're just going to go out about 5 meters uh, in several different directions and see if you can pick up something carefully. Usually you come back on the same lane you went out, like the same spoke of the wheel, come back the same way just so you don't uh, contaminate another area. Uh, this is uh, a re common sense thing to do is if you've got a line of tracks back here, just project that imaginary line out and see, you know, and then go out 30 or 40 meters on it and see if you can pick up. Maybe you'll pick up another track here and then you can resume your track to track. If, if that doesn't work, you can identify your other likely lanes. You know, maybe this is the likely lane of the track, but maybe there's a deer trail over here, and then over here, maybe there's a nice gap between a couple old trees. It might be an inviting route to walk. So you identify those likely routes. And then this is one thing you could do to check them all at once is you just do a wedge search where you walk out like this a distance, and then you cut across all of them like this and see if you can pick up. Um, anything along here and then you come back the next thing you could do is you could you could go and just walk all of those likely trails and see maybe you had maybe it was a game trail here and then we've all seen that in the woods where the, all of a sudden the trail forks into three different ways and you would walk out each one of those and check them and come back see if you can get started if that doesn't work you could go back to what we talked about before just doing multiple circles i find that hard to do in terms of um you know walking a circle but um you could do that with a box search too but you get the idea you just keep going out and out and out until you can find something um if you have flankers with you you have your flankers they would do a circle and make sure it overlap with your circle so that's a good way of just checking this area here while you're still in your formation you can also uh, do what's a flanker crossover you can have this flanker come over to here and this one go back cross here like this depending on your formation then you're getting to a look at all of this area in here in terms of where your track line is the bitterman technique this is kind of interesting it's common sense especially for you sar folks if you're tracking along here and and things are going along you can send a couple people up ahead you know if you've got gps's and maps you can like here you can see there's a creek here and there's a utility right away you can run people right up there or call ahead and have them come out on this azimuth right here plot the azimuth on your map get the coordinates for it and you could have someone go and check and see if uh, there's any sign there if there is you can jump ahead The, the crossbar, this is an interesting one here. Um, in this case here, we have a, a two-track right here, so we send a, a crew up here. One person uh, you know, walks due north here looking for trying to cut the trail. Uh, if it's not right here, they're trying to find out, see if they can cut it up here, and the other person goes this way. If, if you didn't have this two-track here, you would just do a compass azimuth right here, go out like this. One would go out like this. One would go out like this. 
And this is another way here. You could send one of your flankers out like this. You could stay here working the, the um, step to step right here. You could send a flanker out just doing a big lazy Z like this, seeing if they could, maybe the, maybe the trail is over in here and, and, and they'd get fortunate right in here. They might see a track or something. So that's another way of sending one person out with the zigzag. Alleyway scans. This is a good way if you're if you're following somebody on a trail and you lose their track, and you can you'd have your left flanker would go out 50 meters here along the trail, come out to the trail and check it for tracks. This the right flanker here would come up on the uh, the left side here 25 meters and check it. If they don't find anything, then they all then they both start bumping up 50 meters at a time, taking a look at the trail, speeding ahead without necessarily walking on the trail. And we already talked about the box or perimeter scan <clears throat> in terms of looking at an area for lost. And the same thing here, you know, if you lose the track out in the middle here, you can do these kind of boxes. Uh, the, obviously, the fastest ones to do are when you're hand railing along a feature that you can identify because you don't have to do any technical navigation. And that's it. We're not going to get into the uh, the counter. Tra are people familiar with counter tracking and anti tracking? Sometimes, if you're working with law enforcement or something, or a criminal case, you maybe someone's trying to uh, avoid you folks and elude you. So that's when uh, these these kind of techniques come in. Where people will use different techniques to not leave tracks or to confuse you and stuff. That's a whole other uh, skill set there, and we're we're out of time. So um, that's it. Thanks for um, coming, and I appreciate it.